Hello, everybody. Welcome to Swan Signal Live. I am your host, Sam Callahan, lead analyst at Swan Bitcoin. Um, we got another excellent episode for you guys today. But before we get started, I want to talk about Pacific Bitcoin 2024. This is your time to lock in the cheapest prices for tickets. Get those early bird tickets. Go to this QR code right here. You can get a full refund uh, up to February. So this is the time uh, to kind of pull the trigger at the cheapest prices, you know, save those sats. Um, and, you know, Pacific Bitcoin 2023 was one of the best times of Everyone was saying how amazing it was. It was like a festival-like experience. 2024 is only going to be bigger. We're going to get bigger guests. We're going to have bigger uh, events, spaces, parties. Uh, so check it out. Go to PacificBitcoin.com and lock in those tickets today. Uh, so today uh, for the show, we are going to be talking about on-chain analysis. Um, a lot of people get excited about on-chain analysis because it's very unique to Bitcoin where we have this very transparent a ledger full of open source data. And it really lets us see kind of the, the economics of the Bitcoin ecosystem in action. In real time, we can kind of see the investment behaviors occurring on chain. And there's a leading analyst like James Check from Glassnode and David Puel from ARK Invest uh, that kind of are leading the way in terms of how we are viewing these on-chain metrics, what insights we can derive for them about Bitcoin and the users that use this monetary network. So I'm bringing on the show these two because they recently came up with a new framework. So I wanted to welcome James Check and David Puel to Swan Signal Live. How are you guys? Thanks, Sam. Great to be here, mate. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so you guys uh, published a new framework uh, for on-chain analysis. It's called Coin Time Economics. And um, how long did you guys work on this thing? Because it is impressive. It is as long, it is in-depth, and um, I think it's a big step forward for on-chain analysis. So uh, maybe when did you guys start collaborating on this? Uh, let's get the backstory. So it's, there's probably two answers to that question. Um, there, there's how long it took us to come up with the framework, and then there's how long it took us to actually write the thing and publish it. Um, and they're two very different timelines. Um, so the backstory is um, uh, when, when they opened the doors from COVID, it would have been, what, February 2022? Um, we just jumped on a plane to Mexico and uh, uh, caught up with Dave and uh, for the first time. And uh, we, we spent, what, five weeks in a place called San Miguel, um, right in the heartland of Mexico. And uh, we were just bouncing around ideas, um, started with liveliness. And um, uh, Dave, you can probably speak more to, uh, to kind of your process, but uh, Dave's got a really just this creative mind and mine's the engineering mind. So Dave would just bounce ideas. Um, I'd help kind of filter them and get the mathematics right. And uh, it was probably, what, four weeks, five weeks of bouncing around ideas? Yeah, more or less. The, the very intensive work, uh, not sleeping so well, at least for me, because I was obsessed about the topic. Um, <laughs> And then, yes, uh, uh, the, the good pairing of having a creative versus the, the more analytical mind, that pair worked very well in developing something very robust over time. Yeah, so yeah. That, that was what, probably four weeks of development and then uh, it took what, 18 months to actually turn the thing into a piece. So it was uh, two, two, two timelines. Yeah, and Dave, you've been, um, you've been looking at on-chain uh, analytics for how long now have you been looking at this stuff and kind of coming up with new metrics I mean, for a long time now right yeah i think 2018 officially so with the publication of mvrv ratio with murad mahmoudov this was i think september october 2018 what about around so then basically, basically five years now yep five years wow and so really um kind of the fundamental basis of all unchain unchain analysis revolves around UTXOs, right? And the fact that you can kind of see when UTXOs last moved on chain, you can kind of dictate uh, what price they moved at. And that le leads us to see all kinds of uh, kind of derive opinions and, and views on what happens with those coins on chain and what might the investors that have those coins be doing with them. Uh, so let's just, for, for listeners who might not be uh, familiar with it, can you just describe what a UTXO is? I think the best description that I come across is a UTXO is um, best thought of as like a, a dollar bill, right? And that dollar bill can be a 50, a 20, a 10, a 5, a 2. But in Bitcoin denomination, it can be pretty much right, anything up to 21 million um, in theory. 
So the logic is that you've got these uh, dollar bills of various denominations uh, that get moving around the system, right? It's almost like money moving around the SWIFT system. And uh, each wallet, whether it's an exchange, whether it's an investor, um, can hold those for a period of time. And I really, the, the magic of on-chain analysis that you just don't have in traditional finance and what makes it really special um, is, first of all, it's obviously for Bitcoin. But the second one is two, two concepts. We can price stamp them, which is when they are created. We can put a, a timestamp and say, this is the, the point of creation. And we can also put a timestamp on its destruction. Or if it's still unspent, if it's still technically UTXO, we can look at how long it's been held for. And the other one is um, uh, price stamping. What was the price when it was acquired? And what is the price either today, how much profit or loss is it in? Or what is the, 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 its realized price, right? So the delta between when it was acquired and when it was disposed of. Um, so those are the two things that you just don't get at 10 minute resolution is the, the time stamping and the price stamping of pretty much every unit in the supply. And it all comes back to uh, essentially tagging those UTXOs. Yeah. And so when you see things like X percentage of the supply hasn't moved in one year, you know, that's really just looking at the UTXO set, um, looking at the price stamps and the timestamps that you just mentioned. And, um, but apparently, you know, there are some flaws with the way that UTXO analysis has occurred up to this point, And that kind of led you guys to write this paper. And so, David, I was wondering if you could kind of touch on maybe some of the flaws of uh, the traditional, let's say, UTXO analysis that's been used up to this point. Um, I wouldn't call them necessarily flaws. Well, uh, how we see coin time economics in general going back to the time stamping that James just mentioned, I think it's very complementary to the price stamping aspect of things, uh, which has been the, um, the most prevalent uh, mar marker in the UTXO set and how we measure um, any given um, address cohort or balance type against the other. Um, the innovation here is taking time into consideration and applying that concept, meaning the time of a coin unmoved and therefore being held by its holder, um, and taking that very concept to pretty much everywhere we can put it. Uh, that includes um, the supply domain, that includes um, the pricing uh, domains, meaning valuation models that give you a sense of mean reversion. Um, another previously very popular metrics like uh, NVT ratio and the like, and trying to iterate upon them or improve upon them um, by adjusting with time of holding in that way. So I, I think it's improving upon some metrics. It's complementing others, uh, especially as you will see next in, in, in the concept of true market mean and AVAV ratio. That's pretty much both the UTXO prevalent concept with a coin time concept working together and potentially some of the best work we've done yet. Um, and there's also just um, another way or aspect of looking at the market. I think there's another layer to this, which is um, really well illustrated with the concept of lost coins. So we don't really know which coins are lost. Um, you know, we, we look at Satoshi's coins and we make assumptions. Um, quite often, people will use heuristics to say, "Okay, well, the coins that have been older than ten years, they're probably lost. If they've been lost, if they haven't moved for seven years, they're probably less likely than the ten years, but they're still pretty likely. And a coin that moved yesterday is probably not lost, right? Um, but the logic is that you have to actually label those. You have to actually go in at a UTXO level. You need a data scientist to really dive in and go, "That coin is lost. That UTXO is lost. That one's lost." But all of that requires assumptions. Um, so what we essentially do is we, with, with coin time economics, it's almost like a grading curve. Um, you may withdraw your coin from an exchange tomorrow and literally lose the key, but you're the only person in the network who knows that. In 10 years time, the probability that that coin is lost has gone up quite significantly. And what coin time economics does, it gives that kind of grading curve between how long has a coin been unspent and how long has it been spent. So it's kind of like each coin has a lifespan or each UTXO has this kind of um, health bar, how much of it is spent, how much of it isn't. And the more of it that is unspent, the more probable it is to be lost. And the cool thing about that is we don't actually need to say, hey, that's Satoshi's coins or hey, that's an early miner. We can just look at that health bar and say, what is the probability that it's lost or not or long dormant? 
and then make whatever discounts we need on uh, on the economic models uh, that follow. Got you. I I was wondering if maybe we could back up a little bit and talk about maybe Coin Days Destroyed and um, just the basic concept of it. And when we see Coin Days Destroyed go up and down, kind of what what inferences we can take from that data, and maybe we can apply that uh, once we kind of break that down. That'll be easier for the listeners to understand some of the things that you're, you guys have created here. Um, I don't know if either one of you guys could tackle that, but just kind of breaking down Coin Days Destroyed. Yeah, so it's, I mean, Coin Days Destroyed is actually, I think, probably the oldest on-chain metric. It was proposed back in 2011, if I'm not mistaken, um, on the Bitcoin Talk forums. Um, so the concept, it, it actually originated as the Bitcoin Day, um, Bitcoin Day Destroyed. And the logic is one Bitcoin or one unit of BTC will accumulate one Bitcoin day per day. Um, half a Bitcoin will accumulate half a Bitcoin per day. And the way to think about this is each coin is accumulating holding time. Now, we can then measure when that UTXO is spent or the coin is moved. We can measure how much of that time has been flushed out of the system. So let's just go to the market extremes. Um, during bear markets, the hodlers are buying, they're stacking sats, they're putting coins in their wallets, and they wait for the next bull market to take more significant profits. So in the bear market up to that point, these coins are six months, 12, um, 12 months, two years, three years. They're accumulating all this time while they're not spent. And what we tend to see is that coin days destroyed will really start to spike as we get into the raging part of the bull market because these old coins come back to life. They're being spent back into circulation. Um, coins that the market has previously kind of discounted as, as dormant and hodled. Um, they come back into circulation and we can see this by that destruction or that it, it's almost like a volume of time is the right way to think about it. It is literally coin volume times the amount of time it's been dormant. Um, and that coin day destruction is a measure of time being flushed out of the system uh, or more correctly, it's actually a volume and time weighted uh, time weighted metric. But that's really the crux of it. Yeah, I like to view it like if I'm holding a coin, it's kind of like gaining coin time. Over time, uh, you know, if I Correct. hold it and I don't spend it, if I just stack and hold, it's going to gain coin time over time. But when I spend it, that gets destroyed. And um, that kind of goes to the concept of liveliness, right? Um, as coin time gets destroyed, it increases the so-called liveliness that's occurring on the network. And I, I would love it, um, Dave, if you could explain just the concept of liveliness um, and how it kind of relates to this idea of coin time destruction. Sure. Um, so now that we kind of understand coin days destroyed um, as a way and relate that to the concept of activity, liveliness, how much of the network is alive at any given time or in use, transacted upon, um, we can get that and measure against coin days created, which is another concept that um, every single block or every single day, whatever time horizon you want to take, multiplies the um, total circulating supply, uh, supply uh, by the number of blocks. Um, and then over time, that if it's cumulative, um, conforms a, a very a growing an ever growing curve because you're multiplying. Uh, the cumulative sum of circulating supply every single block or day. So that's your denominator, and your numerator, numerator is the cumulative sum of coin days destroyed or coin blocks destroyed, whatever the, the time unit is. So you're basically measuring the destruction over time, the total destruction over time, uh, um, and then ratioing that the total number uh, uh, of time created possible since the beginning of the network hmm. and what you get is out of all the possible time how much of it has been spent and you really just get a percentage right hmm. so right now and that's equals liveliness it tells you how much the network has been alive or active or in transaction uh, since inception right now the number is around 60 percent and has been for for a few years now um, we can go into that um, later in the episode. Um, but yeah, so if, if I give you a liveliness of 60% now, that means that since inception, uh, about 
60% of the coins in the network have churn, uh, especially economically speaking, not just on a UTXO level, meaning one transaction from the miner to um, the first buyer in the secondary market, but actual transactions on an economic sense, right? Yeah. Um, sorry, I lost you there for a second. But so when you say the liveliness, if the liveliness is going down, what would you say in general are some inferences that you could take from that? That that means that holding behavior is increasing, right? right? You can you can look at it uh, um, at the inverse of liveliness, which is voltedness. Categorically, you mean how alive or how active the network is on the one side. And then the exact inverse of that would be how vaulted, locked, um, illiquid the supply or the network is at any given time. And one, it's zero sum between the two. One, one takes from the other always. Yep. Um, so if liveness goes down, of course, vaultedness goes up. That means then coins that have been lost or highly held for a very long time um, are increasing and therefore most likely, all things being equal, uh, there is a, a, a case to be made for a bullish sentiment given that supply is locked and if activity picks up on top of that or demand picks up of, uh, on top of that, then a bullish case could be made. And there's another framework here. I mean, you can think about liveliness. Imagine if every coin that is able to be spent, so all the non-lost coins were spent in the next block, right? In a theoretical sense. Your liveliness would equal the percentage of coins that are that were spent in that block and the remainder, the voltedness, represent all the coins that are unable to be spent. Um, and this also kind of illustrates well, once you've got this concept of liveliness and voltedness, um, we then kind of translate that across into the supply domain because it is just a, a mapping of how much of the supply is active and how much of it is, is vaulted or, or lost um, at any point in time. Um, and the last thing you can touch on there is for, for liveliness. Um, it will the, the steepness of the trend. So it's kind of like a, um, it almost looks like a, like an S curve type shape, the actual chart. But it goes through these periods of very very sharp upticks, and that means that lots of coin days are being expended more than are being stored. So there's lots of coin days coming out of the system. Typically happens when old coins are being spent back into circulation, um, and likewise when you get these very steep downtrends, which we're in actually as we speak. Um, a very steep downtrend is telling you that there's a lot of coin day accumulation and very few people are spending them. So it speaks to that kind of hodler behavior that's, uh, that really dominates around this point in the cycle. Yeah, so, I mean, you see those charts all the time nowadays of how, you know, quote, unquote, the supply is illiquid. It hasn't moved in so long. Um, and that's a bullish sentiment because, you know, those are holders holding on to their sats. And if there's any kind of demand, uh, you know, where are, they get, where are new buyers going to get the Bitcoin from if nobody's selling, right? going to be a higher price um but like you guys are saying like vaultedness is just another way to say that and like david i wanted to throw up uh, the chart that you showed i mean it's kind of echoing what we just talked about but um this is kind of the the lowest vaultedness has been in a long time correct if you're looking at this chart right here it's the highest technically so the, oh, the lowest, highest the, yes, the lowest, right the lowest liveliness and the highest vaultedness uh since 2018 i think since the um, Let's say Q3, Q4, 2018. Um, this is, uh, you know, suggests to us that there, there's a um, there, there's higher conviction for a bullish case right now, given that, especially since 2020, with where you see the the second peak in the chart here, um, is the highest we've ever been in terms of just in move supply, and um, just holders being in control of the network. That being said. Um, if you look at the numbers in the chart, this is a little over 30%. Um, if we look back at the numbers, what is the current number of liveliness? I think it's... I think it's about, should be about be, 60 for liveliness, I think. Right, like 39, right? 30, something 30, like 40%, that. Percent, yeah. Something like that, right. Yeah. Uh, as you can see in the chart there, there's been several years, especially after the, the Bitcoin cash fork in 2017, that saw the, major, the most movement of all coins in the history of Bitcoin. And the metric, the, the voltedness metric collapsed. The liveness met, met, metric rose quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and then 
the market achieved a, a sort of equilibrium since 2018, uh, which uh, we have seen like a, a sort of bounded mechanism in voltedness and liveliness ever since then. Um, so if you take it as an oscillator of sorts and you correlate it to the last few um, tops of the oscillator, when we're speaking about uh, voltedness, uh, we're at the highest level uh, since 2018. We're at the upper bound of that, let's say, bullish conviction level. I think that um, that 2017 run, uh, sorry, Sam, if you just check the chart back up, one more one more yeah, point. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that decline in voltedness is actually really, really interesting. And we, we try to, in the paper, describe the different epochs of Bitcoin. Um, because there's obviously, if you go back to the early years, people lost their coins all the time. Um, you know, if you look at it through the voltedness lens, even though they were mining 50 Bitcoin per block, most of them were going into wallets that have never spent even to this day. So even though there was lots of coins coming into the market, not many people were able to get their hands on them. So the scarcity was actually much higher than we first anticipated. Mm. Now, this 2017 run, um, as Dave said, this is where we saw probably the most expenditure of coin time in the history of Bitcoin. And there's a bunch of things here. Bitcoin went from hundreds of dollars to 20,000. So in terms of just the financial incentive, People are digging around in their drawers trying to find their USB stick where they had those Bitcoins I forgot about from 2012. Like people went to extraordinary efforts to find that money. Um, and the other one is the Bitcoin cash fork. So lots and lots of very old coins who arguably would have stayed dormant kind of proved to the network that they weren't lost by spending to take advantage of the Bitcoin cash fork um, and kind of get that dividend and, uh, and do whatever they did with it. Um, so it was one of those um, very interesting periods where there was numerous incentives to bring lots of old dormant supply online. And the way to think about this, it's kind of reminding the network how much of the supply is in fact not lost. That's kind of one way you can conceptualize um, live innocent voltedness. It's, it's just reminding the market what's lost and what isn't. Yeah, I like to, so I'm trying to get this chart out of the way. I like the I like the idea too. It's like a measure of the economic energy occurring on Bitcoin at any given time. Like that made a lot of sense to me. Um, if vaulted supply is very high, more people are hodling, not as much kind of churns happening on the network. Uh, a lot of times, like right around market tops, you see liveliness increase, right? As uh, kind of these more sophisticated investors, I guess long term investors, start to lock in some profits, maybe take some coins off the table to buy in lower at lower prices because they've seen a few cycles. They've seen that story before, uh, but you see liveliness start to increase towards market tops. And so that's the kind of like inferences that you guys can see in these on-chain analysis. But you guys came up with the, the, the idea of coin block. And I want to go back to that because I think it's kind of the, at the heart of your guys new uh, framework, right? Is this, uh, this idea of a coin block. Um, and so what is it? if you could repeat it again, uh, just kind of go through why you decided to go to coin blocks as a kind of a time uh, to measure these UTXOs. Yeah, it's a really, um, it's a bit of a nuanced topic, but the, uh, the concept is what is a measure of time in a Bitcoin world? Um, so, you know, we, we know the blocks obviously come in one after the other. So one thing that is always correct is actual timestamps. Uh, sorry, the, sorry, the block height. But one thing that's not always uniform is timestamps. So mining is probabilistic, which means that you target the, the protocol targets a 10 minute block time, but sometimes they're at nine minutes 30, sometimes they're 11 minutes, sometimes they're half an hour, sometimes they're three minutes. So the, the spacing or the gap between those uh, each block is non uniform. Now, the challenge is when you're doing something like coin day destruction, what that means is okay, how many coins were there um, per day? there's not a uniform number of blocks, right? Some, some days have 144, some have 145, some have 143. So the days are not uniform. And simultaneously, the distribution, right? Sometimes blocks are mined at nine o'clock, sometimes at 9.05. Mm. There's no, it's not uniform. So really the only uniform measurement of time in a Bitcoin world, if we're really going to measure these things as economic primitives, the only true measure of time that is kind of uniform, no matter where you are in, in, in Bitcoin's life, is block height. So the, the concept of a coin day is exactly the same, except it removes the error bars that exist around that, that distribution of days. Um, so it's a little bit more in kind of the nuance of it, but um, it really kind of gets back to that real crux of, uh, you know, what are the primitives that make this Bitcoin system work? What are the primitives that make this coin time economic system work? And really, it's about just smoothing out and clearing out the, uh, the error bars 
Um, and, you know, block time replaces clock time if you really want to analyze Bitcoin from its, uh, its kind of native, native position. It also implies that if blocks stop being produced, you cannot measure uh, the coin time economic metrics anymore, which should be the case, right? There, there shouldn't be a reason if the, basically if the network collapses and you don't get any, any more blocks, you shouldn't be able to get um, the um, one of the major components of the the metric itself. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, one of the interesting things that you can do with these on-chain metrics is you could almost kind of see the cost basis in general of the UTXO set. Um, and checkmate, when I asked you like what chart to to kind of, if we could throw some charts up here, you said this is the real all caps average cost basis we developed out of the coin time um, economics framework. And um, I want to throw it up, and I, I was wondering if you could talk us through it. It's called Coin Time True Market Mean Price or True Market Deviation, the AVIV ratio. And um, if you could just talk us through, uh, you know, like we're ten years old and trying to understand this, wrap your heads around this, just for the listeners. Um, let's throw this chart up here and walk us through it, okay? Great. So what I'll do here is because uh, this this is most definitely a uh, this is a Dave special. Um, uh, this one. So what what I might do is just talk about kind of how it relates to the original realized price. And then I'll let Dave give a bit of an insight into how this thing actually came to be and, and what it means. Um, so a lot of people believe that the realized price, um, which was invented, I think, back in 2018, um, uh, that was kind of like the cost base of the market. And technically, that's true. Because if you look at every single coin in the supply, it's going to look at what is the average price when it moves. Now, the problem with that system is Satoshi at, at break even, at the theoretical break even level, Satoshi's holding $36 billion of unrealized profit. So when you look at it from that perspective, it's like, okay, what does that actually mean? That means that to be break even, somebody else from the previous 2021 cycle bought the top and is holding $36 billion of losses, right, in aggregate. So in order to get break even, you have to offset all these lost coins. Um, so what the, the, the this model is trying to do is it essentially discounts or removes all of the lost and dormant supply using this coin time economics framework and focuses only on the active investors. So as a result, what we're doing is we're getting rid of the coins that are that can't respond. Even if Bitcoin went to you know $6 trillion price point, these coins cannot spend because they're lost. There's nothing they can do about it. So it actually doesn't make sense to penalize the system and say, well, we're not going to include you in the numerator, which is the realized cap, and we are going to include you in the denominator, circulating supply, um, and essentially, we're underestimating what the true cost basis is. So um, the true market mean price, which I'll, I'll hand it over to Dave now, is at least to our view, um, I, I think the true cost basis of the active investor, getting rid of all those lost coins. Hmm. Yeah, another way to look at it is imagine it as if realized price or realized cap were the cost basis of both the primary and secondary markets, meaning miners and investors. And the true market mean or the innovation here would be the cost basis only of the secondary market, only of investors with active coins. That would be a, um, a better way to put it, especially to so that realized gap can can remain as one of the main uh, contributors to to the metric and, and, and to the space. Uh, but in essence, what we did here is. We had the coming from the, the the coin time world and the UTXO based world. We we found that there's a clear correlation between primary and um, secondary markets and active coins. So, if we can pull up the the chart that yep. we had here, I think I can give the description for both. So, what, what you're looking at here is two things. In black, that's just price, right? Bitcoin's price since. Um, uh, 2020 or so, no, 2018, 2019. Um, overlaid with that, in blue, there's a line, uh, a, a, a blue line there, traveling through the middle of price for the most part. That's the true market mean. Or you can, oh, we also call it active investor price. And, and then below that, in blue, an oscillator, which is the AVAV ratio or active value um to investor value ratio um 
So the way we calculate them, um, it's very correlated one to the other. It's, it's pretty much a representation of one or the other at any given time. The ratio of the oscillator below is calculated by dividing active capitalization. And this means if we go back to liveliness or active supply, we know the percentage of coins that have moved over time. Hmm. So that's about 60% right now. So multiply that with get the active capital, the percentage or the number of the market cap that is that has been uh, mathematically or economically active uh, over time. So we segregate the vaulted capitalization, meaning Satoshi's coins, early miners coins, uh, miner and spend balance and all that stuff. And we, we, we try to focus only on active um, coins in the market or, or in this case, active USD in the market. Okay. And we we'll divide go. that. Yeah, Sorry, go. go on. Yeah. So what do you divide that by? Um, investor capitalization. Investor capital. Which is, yeah. which is real, in essence, realized cap minus miners, minor activity, thermo cap. Got it. Oh, yeah. So the thermo cap. You're, gotcha. you're basically segregating only for the secondary markets. And when you measure one or ratio one against the other, you get a very accurate um, depiction of over or under valuation um, that like, so far proves to be the best mean reversion mechanism. Statistically, we run some numbers and price pretty much stays 50% above, above you know, the, the middle of the oscillator uh, and 50% below it. Yeah, I mean, just to, just to build on that, I mean, as Dave said, Bitcoin's basically spent half its life above, half, above, half below. Um, which means if you break above it, in theory, have you paid your bear market dues, potentially? Um, and the other one is that the long-term mean and median is very, very close to one. Um, and I think this is the most remarkable thing, uh, to be honest, because very rarely in, in any kind of field of, you know, let alone markets, do you find some naturally occurring, you know, moving average or price mean or whatever it is, that has a mean and a median of one, let alone one that has then 50% above or below. So it's got this really interesting property where it is kind of the middle of Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you, where it's currently priced is at about 30K. And I think if you gave, you know, a five-year-old um, a crayon and said, can you draw a line through the middle of the 2021 to 22 cycle? They'd probably draw it somewhere around that 30K level. So it, it does kind of hit that middle ground, um, both statistically, but also just, uh, for whatever reason, it's just where the middle of the market is. So it makes it a really interesting, uh, interesting model. So if I throw this yep. chart back up and like the oscillator back here, you're saying that um, because it's still above fifty percent, that we might have to pay our due still. Is that what I'm hearing? So because it's above the, I mean, look again, it's all statistics, right? But yeah, yeah. Um, uh, if we've spent fifty percent of our time, if statistically fifty percent of the market is below, and we've just spent, oh, you'd have to calculate the days, but um, since Do Kwon blew up with Luna. Um, since whenever that is, May 2022. So from then until now, we've spent below it. Statistically speaking, that means we've got from now until then um, that should, in theory, uh, be above it. But, uh, you know, again, it's kind of cool that we've uh, we've kind of butted our head against this level uh, several times this year and um, only this week we've managed to get through it. So, look, it's going to be an interesting test. Um, but, again, I like the realized price. Um, I, I like to equate these two. The realized price... If you go back to 2015, um, it really formed the, the kind of the ceiling for that whole 2015 period. People didn't know the realized price existed, but people still reacted to their cost basis. And the realized price back in 2015 was much closer to its real um, kind of understanding as a cost basis because Satoshi's coins were seven years old, five years old. They're still young enough that they could be spent. Now we've got much more confidence. This coin time or the, the, the um, true market mean, again, it the market reacted to it before it even knows that it existed. And the reason for that is that that is still where human psychology is anchored. You and I have our own cost basis, but we all respond to our own incentives. And in aggregate, they seem to cluster around this particular level. Um, so I think that's it, there's a whole lot of human psychology baked into this thing, which makes it a really interesting model. Yeah, I think a case can be made that if you have the same data for every asset, you could find the, the true market mean 
for let's say a Tesla stock or gold, if you had ev that granular level of data coming from, let's say a public ledger, registering every purchase and sell of any asset. But that's not the case, only happens on, on Bitcoin. And well, that's the thing. I mean, we did we did test it with some of the other uh, major assets, and we find the same thing, right? It, it has a mean, median, somewhere around one, um, very, very similar properties. So, uh, um, at the very least, within within this industry, it seems to seems to have have relevance. Yep. How do you guys determine if uh, you know coins are quote unquote lost, um, or if it's just you know maybe somebody really is from you know bought some in twenty eleven and just held it for so long, like. Uh, I've heard different kind of methodologies to kind of dictate, like they use statistical analysis and like the probabilities of this being lost. But I was wondering, you know, what you guys use to determine that. Yeah, so I think there's there's two approaches. Um, one is the traditional UTXO model, and the other one is the coin term economics model. So if you go down the UTXO model, you have to actually make the assumption that's Satoshi's coin. Um, that's in a burn address, right? Some of those we know are lost. Some of them um, we've got another one that we call zombie coins. Um, these are coins that have not transacted since July 2010 when we got the first price, right? So now Bitcoin's got an exchange. If coins haven't been spent since then, there's pretty good odds they're lost. Um, sometimes people use coins older than seven years. But again, that's just kind of, you know, getting a bit of an estimate. Um, but uh, what we're trying to do is there is use heuristics to, to estimate which coins are lost. From a coin time economics perspective, the kind of the beauty of it is you don't actually need to know. You actually don't even need to know which UTXO it is. All you do is apply a discounting function. So when it, inside all of your economic calculations, how much supply is available, what's the average cost basis, all these models, it's this self-adjusting thing where you actually don't even need to know which coin is lost. You just look at the aggregate, how much is spent, how much is unspent, and apply that filter over the, all the economic calcs. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of an interesting framework. It's, it's um, Coin time economics is less explicit you don't track individual coins but it's much easier to compute you can compute all of these you know what is the estimate of lost coins very very quickly mm. um, it may not be measuring the actual coin but you still get within very very close to what the utxo model does with the utxo model it's much more data engineering you need to do a whole lot more kind of heuristics and tracking individual coins it's much heavier to compute but you can say that's Binance, that's this exchange, that's this entity. You can go down to much deeper levels. So it's kind of this, this yin and yang of low computation, but high efficiency. Um, and then you've got heavy computation and uh, much more granular. And these two things really um, bounce off each other. Hmm. Yeah, and the less, less assumptions, that sounds good too. <laughs> that's it. It's like, and, and that's the thing, it's yeah. a bit of a check and a balance, right? It's this second model you can use to verify. Cool. And the cool thing about coin time economics is um, with UTXOs, every data provider is going to have their own um, data science magic. With um, coin time economics, everybody will compute the exact same thing because you're using the same input data. Um, and uh, in theory, it's kind of this great equalizer that everybody can use to verify and check that, that middle ground. Hmm. Well, it's really exciting. And like, uh, you know, you guys shared a couple other charts and I want to go through them. And one of them dives into the MVRV. And obviously, Dave, uh, you're the one who kind of created that. So, um, um, I wanted to throw up this chart. It's looking at the short term holding um, SOPR plus the short term holders uh, MVRV pair. And uh, you think it's really interesting in terms of what we're seeing with the recent price action uh, checkmate. And um, maybe Dave, you can explain for the audience MVRV uh, indicator and, and why you created it. And then we could jump into the chart. Yeah, MVRV is market value to realize value ratio. Uh, and it's basically comparing market capitalization to realized capitalization. Um, just as a reminder, realized capitalization is so in market capitalization, you have you multiply a coin times the current price. Realized capitalization, you multiply each coin times the price where that coin last moved, or we infer was last bought. And you aggregate all that, um, and it gives you um, a sense of cost basis of the market. In this case, primary and secondary market it includes miners. Uh, and MVRV, it's simply a ratio of the two, and it gets you a sense of how high is market cap against its cost basis at any given time, or how low. 
And so when we throw up this chart here, uh, maybe checkmate, um, you can kind of talk us through kind of why you think this is significant right now. Um, I thought it was a really interesting chart. Yeah, so, uh, so as Dave said, it's, it, what we're really comparing is kind of the spot value to the saved value is one way to think about it. Um, and what that otherwise means is MVRV tells us about the unrealized. So of all the coins that are not moving, how much profit or loss do they hold, right? So higher numbers means that on average, the in this case, the short-term holder cohort, um, they hold more profit. Now, one way to think about um, holding more profit is the higher that goes, the more the incentive is to take those profits. Um, and we can touch on SOPA in a second, which is basically that taking component. It's the spending counterpart to MVRV. So why do we look at short-term holders? So short-term holders represents coins that have moved within the last five, um, uh, five months. Um, very similar to, to coin time economics, we're looking at those coins it's like the hot ball of money. Recent investors, money that's trading, that's moving around the price. They're basically the coins that are the most active. Um, and statistically speaking, they are the most likely to be spent again. So a coin that was spent yesterday is highly likely to get spent again today. Um, and likewise, again and again and again, until it finally reaches a long-term holder and gets taken off the market. Mm -hmm. So the short-term holders really drive a lot of what's going on day to day. They're kind of that ball of money that's chasing a moving price. So what we've seen here is um, if, you, if you look through the bear market, so 2021, um, early 2021, when I think the bear market really started, certainly from a sentiment perspective, um, and all through 2022, MVRV got fairly deep um, for these guys. So, you know, they're holding 20 to 40% losses. And these are people who just bought. So imagine buying, I mean, most of us probably did this. You buy and suddenly you're down 20%. Now you're down 40%. Like it's, it's hard. It's really brutal. If we look at the recent correction, um, we did get a dip down into negative territory, but it only got down to about 10%. So that sell-off that we had that went from 29K to 26 back in August, there was a lot of panic that happened there, which SOPA will show in a second. But even so, we didn't really get any kind of major dip lower. Um, it was The bears definitely were people panicked and the bears were definitely pushing it lower, but they couldn't get it to go lower, right? We didn't get the same level of bear market trauma that we got back in 2021 and 2022. It was a much more constrained level. So at least to my eye, it feels like we got some spot support that came in at that level. Short-term mm. holders didn't panic to the same extent they did back in 2022. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's pretty meaningful. And obviously, you know, with, with price up near 35, um, that's kind of that spot level, really giving you that, uh, that support uh, that, that just wouldn't get pushed lower. That's interesting. So you have these like more hot ball money, these people that maybe don't have the conviction of long-term holders, uh, but they kind of held that level. There wasn't that much panic in that, in that drawdown in August. And so it could be a sign that maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe that they're more educated, these short-term holders than previous cycles. Uh, maybe, um, maybe they just had more conviction in terms of where things are going in the next short to medium term that they're not selling. Uh, but certainly an interesting chart. And, um, the last one that you kind of shared with me dug into sell side risk ratio. And so let's just kind of move on to that. You know, what is the sell side risk ratio? Um, describe it to the listeners and then maybe we can dig into the chart that you shared of what you're seeing there. Sure. Um, so, so the concept behind this particular metric is, um, and when it's talking about sell side, that's from both um, angles. That's people taking profits and it's people panicking and taking losses. So uh, what we saw very recently, um, I mean, to be honest, pretty much since I would say March, May this year, um, this whole zone we've been trading between like 25 and 30, that, that whole period. We've seen this metric declining. And what that's telling you is that coins that were being spent on chain were not coming from 15,000, locking in a big profit. They also weren't coming from 60,000 and locking in a big loss. They were coming from a very similar price. So they're coming from, you know, if the price is at 30K, they're coming from 29.5 or they're coming from 31. Mm -hmm. They're all kind of jostling around the same price point. And if you think about this from a volatility standpoint, that's telling you that the market was consolidating and everyone who is going to take profits has done so. Everyone who is going to panic and take losses and bail out from the previous cycle has done so. Price kind of needs to go somewhere to create the incentive, either higher or lower, 
to create a new incentive, a new kind of piece of stimulus for people to go, okay, I'm going to react to this candle. So that sell side risk ratio falling is telling you that there's probably volatility in coming. And we saw it reach pretty much all time lows right before that sell off from 29 to 26 in, in August. Um, and it was really, and, and this is where it gets quite interesting. We still didn't see it pick up because that sell off, it certainly got some people moving, but most people didn't react, which again comes back to that education piece you just said. Most people know what they own. And, uh, you know, if you've survived this far holding Bitcoin, most people get it, right? The conviction is pretty strong. And, um, uh, you know, we, we just see that in the sell side risk ratio. People just are not taking profits and they're not panicking and selling. So um, at a loss. So yes, you're right. in this really interesting dynamic where there's just, you know, price needs to go somewhere else to incentivize those sellers. Wow. Yeah, so that's what this is. Uh, this is what's just shown right here is how low it is. Uh, kind of just what you were mentioning, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and you'll see that high values occur in two different events. Um, they occur in kind of like long stretches during bull markets. These are old coins expending lots of coin time and taking big profits, right? So mm -hmm. you can see the 2017, you can see 2021. So this will go higher when lots of profits get taken, but you'll also notice that it spikes at um, uh, major capitulations like the 2018 low, um, at the FTX low when three arrows blew up. These are events when people panic and capitulate. So coins from 60K get washed out at 15K that creates a much, much briefer, but uh, no less a significant uptick in this particular metric. It's so interesting because, you know, the people who bought at 15, 16, 17K aren't moving their coins and people who are at a major loss, 60 to 50, you know, are these people just getting chopped up on this sideways price action? <laughs> just these traders just trading their coins, the liveliness versus in that little range, that price range. I mean, is that what you think is happening? Just... These people Pretty much. Are, yeah, it's, all, it's a lot of up, jostling right? That's around. kind of what you're seeing on change. Yeah, uh, and, and the the um, newsletter we did this week um, was trying to meld this like, because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, on-chain data doesn't lead the price. Well, what we really tried to describe and, and demonstrate is that spot action and, and the on-chain data showed that that floor got put in at 26, right, before we started to move higher. And it was actually the derivatives that were the short squeeze that, that kind of, um, with a fuel that just pushed the market higher. But the floor was established in the spot market. And it was actually then the um, uh, the derivatives just got that extra fuel to squeeze it higher. Yeah, let's let's get into that. Uh, Dave, I think, is having some connection issues. But um, we did see a ton of volatility this week. Uh, it just so happened it was to the upside. And we saw a massive move on the daily. Um, and a lot of Bitcoin Twitter was very, very happy about that move. Um, but you kind of showed that this was kind of driven by the options market. So uh, maybe the explosiveness of the move was particularly driven by the options market. So let's dig into that a little bit just to educate people. Yeah, for sure. And there's these, um, there's kind of three markets. Uh, there's the, the spot market, which is really what on-chain data describes. Um, a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people don't kind of say, oh, that all the trading's happening on futures. But the reality is that there's billions of dollars of Bitcoin flowing in and out in both directions to exchanges every single day. It's 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 quite extraordinary. Um, sometimes it's 30, 40% of spot volume. So significant amount of coins that are kind of printing this data um, on whether they're in profit, in loss, coin days, all the rest of it. So the spot market is one side. You've got the futures markets, which has historically been, it was historically a spot and futures. Uh, where a lot of the trade happens, no question, that's where most of the trade volume happens, um, it, you know, with leverage and all these kind of things. But more recently, we've seen the options market really grow up. And the options market now has similar magnitude, uh, open interest to, to the futures market. Nowhere near the same kind of trade volume, still an order of magnitude lower trade volume, but that's more normal for options. But uh, certainly the amount of open interest, the size of the market is now comparable. And this is relatively new. This is actually a new thing in 2023, more or less. Um, even 2022 didn't have this, this kind of dynamic. And uh, I mean, we saw an 80% surge in um, uh, call option open interest. So lots and lots of people are buying call options and, and basically speculating on, on higher prices. Yeah. And I've been conceptualizing what this may be. And again, this is a bit of speculation on my part. I don't quite have the, the full answer for it. But we are in a tighter monetary regime. Um, firms and funds don't quite have the money to be tossing around that they used to. Um, they've got bond portfolios on fire on the left and they've got equities over there on the right that are having trouble. 
So if they want to take a position in the Bitcoin market, um, it's very possible that they're actually using call options because they can essentially spend the, the call option premium um, rather than spending 30K and buying a spot Bitcoin, they can get 10X, 100X exposure using options and just buy, um, you know, buy the premium and get that price exposure out to December for a much, much cheaper price and use the rest of their capital elsewhere. It's one yeah. of these concepts I've been playing with, but uh, certainly options is a much, much bigger playground than it once was. Yeah, but we can we saw like the kind of the downside of that when you kind of use leverage and obviously trying to time Bitcoin adds a very tricky component uh, to the price action given its volatility. And uh, I mean, just that that false tele coin telegraph tweet. I mean, you saw how much leverage positions were knocked out <laughs> just from that drop rise up and drop down. Um, and and so basically, what I'm hearing is a lot of positives. Like I'm I'm hearing that uh, vaultedness is the highest it's ever been, meaning a lot of the supply is right now dormant or, or theoretically held in, uh, you know, convicted hands, long-term thinkers, uh, people who understand Bitcoin, long-term holders. Um, you also have these short-term holders seem to have more confidence right now. They're not, they're not selling despite the dips. Um, and so we could see a scenario where if demand comes back in, uh, things could get pretty, pretty good here. Would you guys agree? Yeah, I mean, at least from my perspective, um, there's many ways we can measure kind of the tightness of supply. Um, we can look at short-term holder supply, which is pretty much at all-time lows, uh, which means that that means by default, we've got all-time high long-term holder supply. Um, uh, as Dave said, vaulted supply is reaching relative highs. Um, uh, illiquid supply is ticking higher. Basically, all these different tools, we look at different heuristics. How do we slice and dice the supply? What we're seeing is that a very large proportion of the uh, of the supplies held by these high conviction holders. So, in many ways, it's kind of the tightest I've, I've, I've certainly I've ever seen it um, in terms of the supply dynamics. Um, now, naturally, every price right the higher the price goes, the more of these incentives. You know, there's a, there's a price for every hodler, there's a price for every trader where those coins come back online. Um, uh, the only caveat I'll put to this is that the inflow of demand is uh, is relatively soft uh, at this point. So. You can look at that in terms of like transaction volumes on chain. You can look at it in terms mm -hmm. of just general trade volume. So the way I've been describing it, um, the supply is held by hodlers, but there's no reinforcements coming in just yet. I mean, a, a, the pop to 35, maybe that's kind of be the, the first start of it. But uh, it's certainly the, the existing cohort uh, kind of who's left. And we're waiting for that, that next phase and, and next break of, uh, of new demand flowing in. Dave, I wanted to just throw it to you at least. Uh, you know, how, do you, how are you thinking about the on-chain trends that you're seeing for the next, you know, let's just say short to medium term. Um, do, do you see they're, they're positive or, or negative? Or what are some interesting things that you're seeing just more broadly? On-chain overall looks uh, quite positive, in my opinion. Um, if you add to that the, um, the halving day, which statistically, I mean, a few samples, but over time, it it's it's a very good year for for bitcoin and therefore the rest of the industry uh for the most part meaning the year of the having day yeah. which as of now that's uh in april correct um, mm -hmm. last time i yeah. checked um so given that you know seeing some pretty decent accumulation going going back to you know the ftx collapse some um, increasing positive, let's say, layout in terms of what you would have thought would, would have been a, a much worse regulatory environment by the end of 2023, last year, after the FTX fiasco, and seeing the year progress in, in, in such a um, both healthy, cathartic, and um, um, uh, let's say a uh, um, um, much less hostile environment in terms of crypto regulation throughout 2023. That was very surprising to me, but it was great to see. And if you had that BlackRock, which it doesn't ju just seem like a financial or economical event for Bitcoin, but also a, a political one. You know, we're talking about Larry Fink here, as opposed to um, just a trader, right? Yeah. Um, and the fact that Larry Fink seems to be uh, leading that narrative similar to how Paul Tudor Jones and Drunken Miller led it way back in 2020. 
um all of them are, are very good signs going into 2024 so yeah. you know you can expect a lot of chop a lot of uh this uh you know punishment both to to the upside and the downside but for the most part um in my opinion quite quite positive I think the last thing I'd just add to it is um, relative strength. I mean, bonds have had a horrific year. Their drawdown, you know, for long-term treasuries is is bigger than bitcoins at this point in time. Um, you know, equities are having having a couple of challenging weeks. I mean, given all the macro, the geopolitical, all these different dynamics, you just kind of look at Bitcoin grinding higher and then punching the thirty-five, and you go, it's 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 pretty impressive, right? For for an asset that uh, you know was written off as as dead um, twelve months ago. Uh, it's it's you know pretty strong performance. I'd say so. I mean, it's up over a hundred percent year to date. Uh, treasuries are down for three consecutive years for the first time in its history, I believe. Um, I mean, post FTX, Bitcoin was dead for a decade. That was the narrative, right? And, <laughs> yeah, everyone. And, and, and I here mean, we are. Again, so you know how the hell the world changes in a short time. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to end with a couple questions. The one that I wanted to at least touch on is like what are some limitations that people should be aware of when they're looking on on chain uh with some of these uh this analysis um do, what are some of the kind of the major limitations that people should think about you know assumptions that are being made here i know your, your guys work is trying to minimize that but what do you guys see as like something that maybe people should just be aware of before they get into this yeah, I think um, uh, at least from my perspective, it's very easy to get caught up in narratives and to find a metric that proves your bias. Um, uh, I certainly try to come at this and, and look, I mean, go that extra step and understand what is Bitcoin telling you, right? Just just allow, I mean, what is on-chain data? It's like listening to its heartbeat. You're, you're looking at how the actual um, investor behavior is, is occurring on-chain, um, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it's all just data. Um, the challenge is, as an analyst is how you actually craft that narrative and work out what is going on. Um, just because a supply, like long-term hold of supply is a great example. Just because it's climbing doesn't mean the price is going to go up tomorrow. What that's telling you is that five months ago, a bunch of people bought and didn't sell. That's, that's all that that metric is telling you. And you look for, and, and conversely, when they spend, it's, you know, that's going to be an immediate event. So just understand a little bit about the nuance. Um, don't yeah. let the narrative and what you kind of, same as all analysis, right? Don't use the data to prove your bias. Develop your bias based on the data. And if you come at it from that approach, I think it's just a general good advice when looking at markets and, uh, and data of any form. Allow the data to speak to you rather than pushing it into a, a kind of pre-existing um, a, a view or narrative that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. David? Oh, sorry. Click the wrong thing. Um, pretty much um, in tandem with what James just mentioned. Um, perhaps the, I would add to that the fact that you have to simplify, you know, with the, with the risk of getting perhaps too overly married to one single or very few metrics, which is not healthy in it of itself but the there is a case to be made for simplification when you're analyzing any given market not not in terms of picking your favorite metrics or whatever but um in minimizing uh noise for the most part um so i i would suggest um taking a deep dive in whatever a platform like glassnode or the like and sticking to the data and what has provided the, the the most signal to noise ratio over time and sticking to that and trying to simplify it and iterate, iterate upon that as yeah. opposed to overly you know expanding into you know too many metrics yeah you get well you just uh, you led me to my last question so beautifully i gotta thank you um because there is so noisy when you go into on-chain, there's so much data, there's so many ratios, there's so many acronyms. I think people just get overwhelmed. Um, so David, I mean, I'll throw it to you first. You know, what are maybe three metrics that help you um, that are the most signal to noise, the best signal um, throughout all this noise of the on-chain uh, metrics that are out there? Because there's so many um, in terms of just, you know, the health of the network or, you know, 
basically the ones that have been the highest signal over the last you know 10 years or so of, of data uh what are, what are your three favorite metrics to, that people should maybe focus on well as opposed to metrics i'll i'll, I'll give you the, the top three concepts you would need to understand and wh where you can Perfect. get the most information to understand the most metrics right I would say realize gap is very essential. Uh, coin days or coin blocks destroyed or the concept of coin blocks and how they are stored or destroyed in the network. And as a, just a third one, a favorite metric, I think AVAV ratio or the true market mean, which we showed uh, yeah. on this episode. That's my pers personal favorite, but going to realize gap and going to um, coin days destroyed for the basics. Okay. Yeah, no, I would actually agree with uh, with a lot of those, those concepts. Um, uh, certainly, if there's two metrics I would send you to to absolutely learn, um, it would be MVRV and SOPA. And uh, um, MVRV is a derivative of Realized Cap. And uh, we actually released uh, two reports that if, if people are interested in getting into on-chain analysis, um, we released one uh, recently on, on our Insights portal, which is all about the Realized Cap. And it shows you how we break down that metric and how many metrics are actually a child of that concept. So um, MVRV shows you the profit or loss that is in the, in the coins that people hold. SOPA tells you the profit or loss that people are locking in, right? And what drives markets? It's profit and loss. They, these are the things that drive human beings to make decisions. So if you look at MVRV, you're understanding the profit in the coins that are not moving. If you understand SOPA, you understand the profit or loss in the coins that are moving. And then the layer that you put over the top of that is what we call cohorts. Are you looking at SOPA for long-term holders, for short-term holders, for MVRV, for long or short-term? Understanding which cross-section of the market do you care about? Do you care about the hodlers or do you care about the, the hot ball of money? And if you just come at it with that, that perspective, realize cap, MVRV, we've got a paper called Mastering MVRV, SOPA, um, and then cohorts over the top. If you master that bucket of three or four concepts, um, it just opens up the whole door because at the end of the day, profit and loss is what drives these markets and uh, those metrics describe it from all the different facets, just different cross-sections of the supply. Hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you guys so much for coming on here and sharing your expertise. I mean, I couldn't think of two better people to explain these concepts. And so can't thank you enough for coming on. Uh, once again, I would give listeners... Um, kind of point them towards coin time economics the report that you guys authored it, it it it's very detailed and it goes actually to a lot of the beginners concepts as well it describes a lot of what we talked about in terms of utxos coin days destroyed um it's 128 pages so everything you want is in there so go read that they put a lot of work into putting it together so once again congratulations guys it's a it's a really interesting framework and i think it's going to drive this uh on-chain analysis industry forward so congratulations and uh thank you so much for coming on the show where can people kind of read some more of your work or follow you guys on social media if they're interested in just uh keeping up with your work so david um yeah deep well arc and on twitter or x um <laughs> or arc um dash invest.com great and uh, at underscore checkmatey on Twitter. And uh, you'll find all of our work. We've got two sources. One is at insights.glassnode, um, which has uh, got all of our weekly reports and, uh, and analysis pieces. And then we also have a YouTube channel, which is just at Glassnode, um, where we do a, the, basically the, the week on chain, but in a, uh, in a video format. So um, that's been going for almost three years now. So we've got uh, plenty yeah. of content to dive into. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I follow those market updates. They're great. So uh, It's like a rolling masterclass, which I hope uh, someone at the end of the day will write a textbook on. <laughs> of course um, well thanks again guys um, thanks for your time uh, have a wonderful rest of your day really appreciate you guys coming on Swan Signal Live thanks Sam cheers cheers wow there's a lot to take in there I hope it maybe clarified some things with on-chain metrics I mean those guys are in the weeds uh, following this stuff uh, more than I am so I learned a lot with you guys um once again, just check out that report. It, it's fantastic. Uh, go read it. I had, I'm going to read it again probably later tonight. Um, so checkmate, David Paul, thank you so much for joining us. 
Uh, once again, I want to tell you guys about Pacific Bitcoin 2024. Uh, this is your time to lock in those cheapest prices. You can get a full refund in February. So just buy it. And, and if you decide you can't go for some reason, uh, you can get a full refund. So now's your time to kind of lock in that price. Uh, there's not much risk at all to doing it. So if you went this year and you, you definitely want to go again, now's the time. And if you didn't come for some reason, uh, first off, you missed out. And second off, now's your time to uh, kind of make up for that mistakes and lock in those tickets as well. So go to this QR code pacificbitcoin.com and uh that's it for the show uh we got another big guest next week we got mr adam back coming on so looking forward to that conversation thanks again for listening i appreciate every single one of you guys so like comment um and comment in the replies let me know how i could help or improve anything i could do to kind of make this show better for you guys it's all about education it's all about helping people understand bitcoin and the opportunity that exists here so thank you so much have a great day and i will see you next week